Okay, I can see we've still got a few people joining, but I'm going to get started. It's a couple of minutes past noon. Um, so just a, a very warm welcome. Um, thank you to all our members uh, for joining us for this afternoon's seminar. And we're going to be discussing the topic of transitioning out of the crisis. So the event will last for about an hour. And I'm just going to start by running through some housekeeping. So this event is an online seminar rather than a webinar, webinar, which means that instead of death by PowerPoint, I'm going to be interviewing a panel of industry experts on this topic so that you can hear their views and their experience and their ideas firsthand. We're also going to take the opportunity to benchmark some key areas. So we'll be doing a few polls shortly and my colleague Sarah will be joining me to take you through these. Now you should be able to see the faces of the people being interviewed, uh, but please don't worry. Uh, your own devices are automatically um, set to video off and mute. We do literally have hundreds of people um, registered for today's event, over 500 people. So unfortunately we can't take live questions. However, if you look at the bottom of your screen, just hover your mouse over the bottom, there is um, a section for Q&A. So please feel free to put questions in there at any point during the seminar. I'll try and pick them up as we go. Hopefully some of the speakers will naturally pick them up. Um, and if not, if we don't get to them by the end, then we'll gather all the Q&A and we'll make sure that we respond to all of them. We'll, we'll put um, answers to all of the questions on the CCMA website so you've got uh, visibility of all of them. And finally, we will be recording the whole of the session. So if you do want to share it with colleagues, it will be um, on the CCMA website um, by tomorrow lunchtime. So on our panel today, I'm joined by Ian Ashby, who's the Principal Strategist at ServiceNow, Adrian Jap, the Quality Manager at CDL, um, and John Sullivan, who's formerly Chief Innovation Officer at Virgin Trains. And I'm going to introduce you to each of them shortly. Uh, today's seminar is supported by CCMA Platinum Partners, ServiceNow. They'll be very well known to many of you on this call as a global provider of IT solutions. They were recently recognised as the fastest growing customer service solution vendor globally by Gartner. And they are used in the UK by some large well-known brands that, um, that you'll know, such as Vodafone, Capita, Post Office. Uh, and very, very busy supporting the NHS right now. So Ian Ashby is the Principal Strategist uh, for Customer Service at ServiceNow. And his role is to help organisations successfully transform their customer service and customer support operations. Gonna, so I'm going to start by introducing you to Ian. Hello, Ian. Hi, Anne Marie. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Ian. Pleasure. Can you just give, um, I know we'll be coming back to you as part of the panel interviews later on, but can you just give us a brief overview and history of ServiceNow? Yeah, thanks, Anne Marie. Obviously, we're, we're delighted to be involved with CCMA. We're a, we're a new platinum partner, but, but really enjoying our relationship um, and, you know, really pleased to be able to support this webinar today. Um, as you mentioned, we sort of our, our heritage is mainly in that IT area, things like IT service management, IT business management, you know, security, risk and compliance. What we found is that um, organizations were using those very strong workflow capabilities that they were using for their internal IT and started to use them for external customer facing uh, customer service, if you will. And so that's created, if you like, a whole set of new capabilities that we've been selling into the marketplace now for about four or five years in that whole, what we call customer workflows. So something we call customer service management. And that's the products that you were describing that are used by the likes of the post office and the NHS and so on. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, big, big users in, in contact centers. So hence our relationship, hence our interest in, you know, forwarding that, um, uh, you know, relationship, if you like, and getting broader. Hence, delighted to work in the CCMA and delighted hopefully to share with some of the other folks on the panel today, some of the things that we've been doing in that customer service contact center space. Great, okay, thank you very much, Ian. We'll, we'll come back to you um, in a little while, if that's okay. Um, what I'd like to do is um, just start by doing um, a poll. So we, we do like to give you the opportunity to kind of benchmark where you are against um, other organizations. So we're going to um, just do a quick poll, which is five questions. Um, so I'm joined by my friend um, and colleague, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Good afternoon. 
So hi everybody. Um, so Sarah, can you um, kick off the, the first poll question? Um, if you want to read them out and then um, people can respond. Yep, so the first question is, how well prepared was your organisation for a major and unprecedented disruption like COVID-19? Um, I can see some of you have already started, but uh, we have not uh, prepared at all. Okay, but we managed, we were well prepared and we were very well prepared and we did an excellent job. I think we might guess at some of the responses here, but um, it's good It's good to get a benchmark. I mean, obviously it's been a, a time when everybody's been very quickly uh, scrubbing their business continuity plans uh, and updating them kind of really live. It's, it's, uh, it's been quite a reactive situation we've all been in. So we're up to about 70% of people who've um, registered an answer. Just give it a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds. We're not going to hold you to it. We're not <laughs> going to uh, name and shame or anything like that. It's all anonymous. Okay. Yeah. So the results are in. Okay, so not a, a fair mix. I think the okay we managed is very typical of contact centres. We're, we're pretty good in a crisis. We, we kind of, you know, roll our sleeves up and get on it and, and make it happen. And certainly that's been our experience when talking to members that have had to react really quickly. Great. Thank you for that. So let's Great. move on to the second question. Yeah. So the second question was, um, all right, one second. You're, sorry. Second question is what was the biggest business continuity challenge um, and was it limitation of technologies was it um, employee resources was it employee engagement and motivation adapting processes to support customers or changing in customer demand now you can you can select more than one um but we, we want these to be some of your significant challenges, but you may you may find two or three of those, or indeed all of them were, were real challenges for you. So feel free to select more than one. So the votes are coming in, we're about 67, 68%. So we have a couple more seconds. Okay. Yeah. It's actually a single choice on that. <laughs> and the results are in. Wow. Okay. Perhaps not unsurprising. Um, a little frustrating, I know, for, for all the contact centre leaders that have been trying to get various technology solutions um, past the boardroom and, uh, and then find yourself in a crisis with, uh, with limited technology. So 48% saying that's the biggest the biggest issue was limitation of technologies. So uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the third one. Third question is, um, what part did innovation play in the business continuity solutions you deployed? And we've got options are not at all, limited examples, some examples deployed, um, and innovation is a key part of all our solutions. So I guess given the previous question about technology um, being a bit of a bit of a challenge, that might give us a clue to some of the answers here. Um, I think I think it did require people to kind of think outside the box and push the old rules to one side and say, well, this is this is a new normal, um, and we have to make this happen. It's not a choice. We, you know, particularly looking at, um, at uh, getting people working from home. Okay, Sarah. Result. Yep. The results of that one are in. Okay, so actually, actually not not bad actually. So that suggests you know people had to think outside the box. People had to um, you know deploy some creativity and innovative innovation to get going. Innovativity is that a word? <laughs> um, so 45% send several examples of innovation. Okay. Great. 
So our fourth question was, do you think your organ, sorry, one second, do you think your organisation and strategy or priorities for innovation and digital transformation is the new normal, and the new normal will change? Yes, definitely. Um, yes, probably it will change a lot. Yes, we're expecting a little bit of change. Um, no, we won't change any of our strategies or priorities and um, we're not sure and we don't know. So, will your strategies or priorities for innovation and digital transformation, gosh, we've been talking about digital transformation for years and people still seem to be at various different ends of that um, particular journey. So do you think that your priorities <clears throat> in that respect will change in the new normal? And the, that's the results. Okay, so yes, definitely it will, it will change significantly. 30% thinking that the priorities will change significantly and 48% saying it will change a lot. So um, very few saying it won't change our, our priorities. So 3% either believe they're already there, they're very innovative, or haven't smelt the coffee. Um, let's, hope, let's hope it's the former. So, so yeah, I guess going back to the to the day to day will be far from normal. Okay, so the final question. Right, our final question. So who led that customer service transformation of your company? We can't see it, Sarah. Sorry. Um, who led the customer trans service transformation of your company? Was it the chief exec? Was it the chief innovation officer? Was it the customer service director? Or was it COVID-19? Ho, ho. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose other might have been an interesting choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the last of the polls. If you want to click your answer, that would be fabulous, and then we'll move on. Just give it a couple of seconds okay. where we were before. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll just end that now. Show the results. Okay. So, uh, fifty-three percent felt that COVID was in charge. Great. I mean, it's, I guess it's still saying that we had to be very reactive to the situation. This was, you know, dare I say, unprecedented. We've heard that word more than we expected in the last couple of months, but, but there it is. Um, but great to see some leadership take place, but interestingly, really quite low on the chief innovation officer. And maybe people are saying that role doesn't exist in their organisation that you know, may well certainly resist, uh, exist when they go back to work. Great. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you, Sarah. If you can close the polls um, and then we'll move on. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the panel interviews now. And as I said, we've, we've got um, three panellists that we're going to talk to today and just ask them to share their experiences. So I'm going to start with Adrian. Adrian Jap um, is the quality manager and Adrian works for CDL, which many of you will have heard of and no doubt be working um, off their systems. So Adrian um, has 17 years experience in quality management and IT service delivery. He heads up the team that manages and delivers the service management software solutions at CDL. He's been particularly busy lately because um, for his sins, he's also a significant part of CDL's business continuity team. Um, so if you can just turn on your video, Adrian, and uh, microphone and join us. We're on and here. Hi, Marie. Thank you. Hi, Adrian. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Great. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Adrian, um, if I can just throw it out there, really, um, I know you're going to share a few slides with us, but say, how did CDL um, cope? How did they get ahead of uh, COVID-19 and the situation we all found ourselves in? So, so, so there is, is the big question, really. Uh, and again, if we, could, we can kick off that, that slide. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, it was a big one, COVID-19. It's a big one for us all and still is and will be for a, a long while to come, obviously. Um, so, you know, we, w when this hit, we were quite uh, early on the scene in terms of our, our response to it. Uh, and, you know, we... we we had already prepared, which which I'll go on to in a little in a little bit, uh, for the actual um, 
a crisis such as this. But there's always a reactive element and seeing from the polls there, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of reactive answers uh, when this thing hit. And a lot of companies have, it's, it's, it's hitting them blindside to a certain extent. So how did CDL react and how did we do so well and why are we still doing so well uh, in this situation? So if I can just flick to the next slide, uh, slide Sarah. Uh, oh, well, that's, that's me reacting to the challenge of the, of the pandemic there. Um, so um, I'll quickly move on from that slide because it's... Not gin and orange there? Gin and orange there? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to uh, disclose what it is because that's in work time. So, uh, and neither could you see Netflix behind me or anything like that. Um, so reacting to a challenge such as a pandemic, it's not something we just reacted to. We'd already spent a, quite a long time preparing and planning um, to make sure that we could keep serving our customers just despite what might happen to our business, our premises, our people, market forces, or, or anything like that. And we came up uh, a number of years ago with uh, the commercial realization that we needed a solid business continuity management system to ensure that our business continued and we continued to serve our clients as, as, we, uh, as, as we needed to. We are a software house. We have a, good, uh, a large number of clients who are blue chip companies who will, will not tolerate um, service disruptions for any period of time. We needed to be in a position where we could make sure we would be responsive no matter what happened. So we registered ourselves and we're now certified to ISO, ISO 22301. I've been, and I've been for a few years. And we have a solid and comprehensive business continuity plan uh, for all sorts of scenarios and we practice this regularly uh, and our compliance team uh, are, are diligent in their duties to making sure we are always up to date constantly reviewing this process uh, and looking out at what's happening in the outside world so what we have is, is is this little booklet here that i'm waving in front of you now which is actually our business continuity plan highlighted on the uh, early warning of a pandemic outbreak page uh, so we have a process there already lined out to react to that. So before this all kicked off, we'd already seen the signs kind of at end of last year, start of this year, that something was going to happen. Um, so we, we put ourselves on, on almost a standby basis with that, with that in mind and kept, it, kept listening to government, kept listening to the World Health Organization and all of these people to make sure that we were in a place where we could react quickly. Now, this, none of this happens by accident, of course, uh, and we've been preparing a number of years for all sorts of work scenarios, including already existing changes in how people are working. Uh, and that links very well into the ServiceNow piece, so I'll just come on to it in a minute. So the primary issue with the COVID-19 crisis and keeping our systems up, to de up, up and running was the people. We are nothing without our people. We're 600 plus in CDL. Uh, and we needed to make sure all of those people were safe, well, and ready should anything, you know, should worst case scenario happen and it'd be, you know, hit a level five serious pandemic. So we jumped ahead of the government and we, on, the, on March 16th this year, decided to work from home wholesale. So we pushed all our people out within 48 hours from office to home, fully equipped and fully working without any service disruption at all. And that means zero service disruption. So we did quite well that. Now, that's not an accident. And a number of years ago, especially when we were coming online with ServiceNow, we'd already adopted the cloud first technology um, aim. So all of our systems are, generally speaking, cloud first now. And that means service now, that means applications like Microsoft, uh, Office 365. It means the phone systems with Anywhere 365 and things like that. And make sure that we integrate all these systems together so that everybody can connect anywhere, anytime, by almost any means. So it doesn't mean I have, you have to have a, a two screen uh, PC set up with a phone and things like that. I mean, we can literally operate from a tablet uh, and, and, and still keep our businesses going. Um, so that was the key thing. It's, it's the key thing about the cloud first, the non-geographic system. We didn't want to be locked down to any, uh, any, any, any area. Also, we could see that there is a change anyway happening. Now, COVID-19 for us has kind of just accelerated what we were already looking at already. So 18 months ago, we put in place a home working policy for all employees. 
uh, and regularly have various teams and people in those teams working from home. So that was already in place. So we were at a considerable advantage there in having all our staff geared up with, all, with laptops and all of the uh, systems that we needed to, um, to keep them people working from home. So we are where we are now. Um, we're not in the office. There are approximately on site today, three staff on site today. I can see that from a dashboard in front of me. Uh, and that's uh, one facilities um, member and a couple of the infrastructure guys are, are sat in the office all on their own in an empty building. And the rest of us are at home fully working and fully connected. Challenges, there are a great many with uh, something like this, including from a management perspective and all our line managers, there is a, a significant shift in management and how we deal with these things. So it means that, you know, our, all our managers suddenly have to uh, adapt to a new way of working and new problems that may face them. And these, these can um, be things from somebody having a, a, a broken internet connection at home. It could be somebody who is lonely on their own uh, suffering from uh, the mental health challenges of being at home all the time, stuck in the house, for example, feeling isolated and all of those things. So we needed to make sure that we shifted our focus to a much more hands-on, close relationship with the teams that we manage. It's all about being aware of the, the sudden new world we were in. So part of the BCRT uh, process was to make sure that we geared up our line managers to be prepared for this new world. In terms of business continuity itself, we'll, we have a business continuity response team. We meet three times a week now. It was initially every day or, or twice a day, initially at the very start of this. Uh, so we have a very short term review loop of how effective we're being. So every two days, we've got up to date reports, up to date stats. We know what the issues are. We know where the problems may occur and we can be predictive in, uh, uh, in the event management uh, side of things. So that, that gives us, a, again, a, a significant advantage in staying one step ahead of where we need to be. And we were so successful in the first couple of days uh, in making sure we continued our business that we started reaching out to our customers and said to say to them, how are you doing? At what position are you in? And we started recording all of that data so that we were prepared that when customers called in, we were aware that they were having connection issues. We were aware that some of the guys that we speak to didn't have laptops, for example. Uh, you know, we, we, we saw signs from other companies that, you know, I've spoken to of people, uh, you know, ordering a thousand laptops for their staff on day one quickly and wondering why they weren't arriving and, you know, the, a certain panic element. So we reached out to our customers and, uh, to, to say, actually, if there are issues, contact us by whatever means that you can and we will help you and adapt our systems. So the core of this really, you know, in, in terms of this, um, in, in this, you know, what we're talking about today is how does ServiceNow fit into this? Well, we've been live with ServiceNow for three years and it's our core workflow management system. So for our service desk operation over the phone, through the internet, portals, through email and all of those mechanisms, ServiceNow is the core of that function. So every, most of the stuff that comes into the, com, com, through the, into the company comes through ServiceNow. It's dealt through in efficient workflows and managed accordingly. So that fits very well within the organization. And ServiceNow cleverly um, released a, an emergency health report application, uh, which they, they provided free to all ServiceNow users uh, a couple of months ago. So we rolled that out very quickly uh, within the organization so that we've now got dashboards of staff status for every single member of staff that we have. And that's checked by the line managers every day to make sure that that's up to date and the BCRT team VCRT and HR have got up-to-date data about how many staff we've got available at any time. That means that we can continue our business exactly as we want to do uh, and, and, and can predict where we're going to be in terms of staff numbers and capability going forward. So that's really, in a nutshell, hurtling through that, um, all, all I need to say now. Fantastic. So uh, back to you, Anne-Marie, on that. I think uh, I think there's a lot of people listening to this very env enviable of your position. Yeah, um, I, th I think we're doing quite well. Yeah, it's a luxury position. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess your organisation is living proof that you could have been prepared for this. Um, you, you were prepared for it, and you reacted fast. And you know, just just saying that you have three calls a week now to discuss it, and you know, certainly most of our members are, are on three calls a day. No, you know, not exaggerating that. 
um, just to update and, on the current position. So it, it does show with, with a good plan this is, this is possible. Mm. Um, um, I guess another question is, have you had the call from Boris yet to go and help out? Uh, not yet, I haven't. No, no. I was thinking of uh, off, uh, put, reaching out, but no, I've got enough to do, I think. A few gaps there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm sure it wasn't without its, its hiccups. There are always some lessons learned and it, it, it feels like maybe one of them was, was the people side of it in terms of, you know, the plans were all there, but when you actually have to deploy everybody um, home, then you, you do come across, you know, engagement issues or health and well-being. What, what have been those key challenges for your, for your people? Yeah, I mean, we, we are very much a people first company. Uh, we are a top 100 employer in the country. And um, so our our staff and our, our, our colleagues recognise this. So that, that's all good. So we, we immediately put in place the communication systems through Teams chats and daily meetings, encourage all our managers to do these, to, to head up any situations that may occur. And the situations you, you do find, you will still find, will be those of, uh, people feeling isolated, feeling detached, not being able to stand up and talk to the colleagues in the office and things like that. And you have to hit these things head on. So we adapted quite quickly, again, through the, through the BCRT um, system in making sure that we geared up things like HR support, you know, within a week uh, of being um, working from home, we'd already set, a, set up a HR help helpline, for example, that was manned properly by our HR team to make sure that not only do those people who are on the daily calls with the teams um, have, a, have a mechanism to speak about issues that they may have, and we have had very few to be fair, uh, but also that they've got a nice private safe line to, to pick up the phone and, and just talk to people. Um, you know, it does challenge people in, in, in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what's your view on how the world of work might change going forward. There's lots of discussion and speculation about home working and whether that will continue to the same scale, et cetera. What, what's your experience of view telling you on that, Adrian? Uh, it's telling me that it's an acceleration of things that were already happening, basically. Mm -hmm. And especially with the work with ServiceNow and things like that, the world of work is changing. Um, one of ServiceNow's taglines is, is to make you know, work more like life, you know what I mean, in, in how, how you operate. Uh, within the working environment so it's not something that wasn't going to happen it's not something that comes to a shock it's just happening faster so home working's very much here to say uh, ab absolutely yeah and you know in, in transition out of, out of this area where we, where we are we're already putting plans in place to change how we work between office and home yeah. uh, and that accelerates the flexibility of those staff uh, who wish to work from home to carry on working from home because we've seen there's no service disruption there's yeah. no loss in productivity uh, and there, there is no significant or if there's no um, change in the levels of service that we offer to our clients yeah and in terms of um, having the necessary equipment available at home is that guitar behind you part of that no oh, that's definitely part of it yeah that's, that's a stress relief uh, element yeah so uh, i won't be banging out a tune on this uh, seminar unfortunately unfortunately for you yeah Wonderful. That's great. Thank you very much, Adrian. We may come back to you at the end if, we, if we've got time, but uh, thanks very much for, for sharing your experience and showing us that you know, it can be handled well and, and, um, and having the right plans in place is really, really important. So thank you for that. I'm going to invite Ian back now, Ian Ashby, um, who um, is, as I said before, the principal strategist at ServiceNow. So Ian, we've, we've heard from Adrian about how CDL were able to get well ahead of the, the COVID-19 uh, virus having the right kind of plans and systems in place. We're now entering a new phase, slowly, uh, coming out of the lockdown. Um, it'd be useful if you could just share your thoughts on how organisations can stay compliant whilst managing to, to, you know, remotely manage other people or get them back to work, because that's, uh, that's massively important to our members. Yeah, thanks, Anne-Marie. I'm, I'm hoping my internet connection is going to hold up. I'm getting those lovely messages we all get from time to time about your internet connection is unstable. So I guess another of the challenges of home working and, uh, and COVID-19. So hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you said just slowly coming out. And obviously, we've seen a lot of stuff even over the last few days with the, you know, the announcement that was made, um, you know, in terms of relaxation of lockdown, etc. Um, I think it's definitely a dynamic and fluid situation. 
Um, I think there's a very good document, and I've got a link in, the, in my deck in a couple of slides time, give you exactly where you can find this. There's a really good document that came out just a few days ago, just a week ago from the government, which is very specific, I think, to this audience. It's called Working Safely During COVID-19 in Offices and Contact Centres. Yeah. And that's got some really good advice and some content around that. So if you, if you read nothing else and if you're you know, trying to get ahead of the curve, I think I would, I would absolutely recommend that. And that talks a lot about being compliant. I'm glad you said that in because the CCMA worked with them on it. Yeah, yeah. And I know that was a big part of what you've been doing, Anne Marie. And I think um you said before the CCMA is the only organization representing, if you like, the contact center industry that's informing that. And there's some really, really good stuff in that. The other little sort of um picture I'm showing there is is some of the stuff that we've doing. And Adrian kind of touched on that, you know, obviously as a big provider to customer service and contact centers, we've been thinking very carefully around how we can help. Um, uh, and Adrian mentioned some of the applications we've made available free of charge very early on. And, and I think, you know, now getting into this return to workplace, interestingly, we actually just made an announcement last night about some new capabilities that kind of fit into this, this uh, piece because we, we're getting huge demand from our, our customers around, you know, those whole areas around employees, um, the health and safety, the engagement, the communication, automating that, tracking that, and we'll perhaps come to that more. But obviously, the, the safe working environment. So that's a big, big piece of the puzzle. If you could just go to the next slide for me, Sarah. I thought I might walk through, if you like, some of the things that I've sort of picked up and through all the stuff that, that we see and what I've been seeing and just talk to these very briefly, if that's okay. So kind of looking at this back to work piece, um, there's a very clear sort of um, piece in the UK that organizations have a legal responsibility to protect their workers and others that interact and, and come into the office and do deliveries and so on. You know, and, and fundamentally the advice around being compliant is that the organization needs to think about the risks that those workers and others face and do everything reasonably practicable to minimize them. I'm deliberately choosing those words carefully because that is the, the essence of, of managing that compliance piece. Really important actually, and it wasn't something that I realized until I got into the detail on this, risk assessment is mandatory in this scenario for any organization that has more than five employees. So, you know, if, if your organization is not thinking that through and is thinking about bringing back people back into the office, assuming that they mainly work from home today, you have to have that formal risk assessment. And in fact, the, again, that guidance is saying that they expect most organizations to publish the results of that risk assessment on the website. And they expect it for all employers who've got more than 50 workers. So if you think about that compliance piece, again, it's around, you know, doing the work, but also making it visible and, uh, you know, available to employees, to customers, to suppliers, et cetera, so they can see that that work has been done. There's also a very strong mandate around consulting with employees, you know, in, employees as a whole, you know, work, work councils, unions, whatever. They have a duty to consult people on health and safety, and this absolutely fits in that category. But it's not just around that. It's obviously the whole thing, you know, that I guess you were touching on earlier on, Amory, around, you know, the, the hearts and minds, you know, kind of get people buying in, you know, making sure you don't have disputes. Uh, understanding at an individual level the concerns and, and seeking to allay them. And I saw some things on the Q&A around things like uh, childcare and things like that. Understanding, you know, concerns and questions people have around that, picking that up and reacting to it and, and, and communicating through that. I think it's also fair to say right now, this is the fluid bit, work from home is still the number one option. You know, but, there may, but there's reasons perhaps not to, you know, to, to want to go down that route. It could be around... You know, you've got issues with with um, systems or with uh, employee well-being or, you know, people struggling to work from home because of their particular personal circumstances in terms of dealing with, you know, kids or, you know, perching on the ironing board or whatever it is that, that people are using to, to work currently. But, you know, so there's those that you're thinking about bringing in, but also those that do stay working from home, you've still got to monitor their well-being keep in touch, make sure they have the right equipment, you know, that they're being looked after. So, so all of those things come into play. There's clearly this whole issue about the, the duty to reduce the workplace risk, you know, the social distancing that's expected. So, so this is not coming back in the old model, it's coming back in the new model. If you do come back, you have to try and keep the two meters distance the whole time. 
So think about that for a second. You know, it's not just the workstations and the work areas. It's arriving and departing. It's moving around the office. It's, you know, who's going to be in the teams. It's the common areas, the lunch area, the vending machine, the coffee cups, you know, that kind of thing. The bathrooms. What are you doing with the cleaning and the hygiene? There's a lot of things to work through that you have to programatize and think about how you're going to achieve, you know, the, the piece and the communication and the training for your employees to make them understand, you know, what's expected of them and how they're going to work. Um, there's a couple of very specific things around vulnerable people, and it's vulnerable in this context. So it's vulnerable, you know, perhaps information that you, you won't have on your systems that's relevant here around things like, um, uh, you know, do I, do I, um, do I have a, 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 an illness or whatever that makes me in that vulnerable category that perhaps wasn't relevant to my day-to-day -day work normally, but is now? Um, or, you know, have I got childcare issues because the kids are at home now, there's no one to look after them, you're asking me to come into the office because they're not back at school yet, um, things like that. But also if you're vulnerable, you actually get priority for lower risk jobs. So again, just thinking that through as an employer, and then obviously the usual things around equality and discrimination, particularly disabled workers and expectant or new, or new mothers. So again, things, things to kind of work through. And then the final kind of comment here really is just around, you know, protecting yourselves by automating, having those systems to plan, schedule, track, monitor and, and communicate. You know, that's really where people like CDL are using systems like ServiceNow to help them with that. Now, there's a, there's a final point. Now, I just thought I'd share a very specific example. And I think, you know, that everyone can understand that don't make headlines for the wrong reasons. No one wants to do that, want to make headlines for the right reasons. But I just thought I'd share something. Some of you may have seen this one. There was a, there was a, a call center in South Korea right early on in the, in the, in the process. Um, they had about 800 uh, employees working in the call center across four floors. Um, they had 97 instances of COVID in that call center. So if you think about that, now break that down a little more, 94 of those were on a single floor out of the four, and 79 of those are in the same section within that floor. So on the same floor, they had about a 44% COVID hit rate, if you will, and not in a good way, had almost a 60% hit rate in the section. So you think about the, you know, the, the bad scenario, if you like, you don't get this right, you bring people back, you don't sort the social distancing, you have more normal type um, contact center setups and so on that's the sort of risk that you can have with one person effectively creating you know the, the the thing so that's the sort of thing that you've got to manage and that's the you know why you have to pay all this attention in terms of compliance your systems your tracking etc to really make it worse that's a very specific contact center example scary yeah so just, I said I'd share the, the details there. For those of you that are interested, obviously you'll see this in the deck and the recording, but I definitely say uh, get that information there. There's a bunch of stuff around what, what we have been doing as ServiceNow as well, if you're interested, our crisis management apps, Adrian mentioned those, and also the hot off the press um, information about what we're doing around the, the safe return to the workplace. So more things there if people want to get into this in more detail. That's fabulous. Thank you, Ian. Um, if I can just ask you a couple of questions. Um, you've obviously got a lot of clients. You cover a lot of areas, uh, as we, I guess, do for members. Have you seen the types of requests for help change? Um, and I guess I'm, I'm making that differentiate between when things first hit, you know, yeah. so end of March and, and now. Have you, have you seen the, the help that organisations are asking you for differ? Yeah, I, I would absolutely say that's the case. I think when things really kicked off, <clears throat> it was all around the classic sort of, I call it emergency response. You know, so we, we had a lot of um, uh, interactions with governments actually helping them to manage the whole, you know, uh, spread and monitoring of, of COVID-19 amongst, um, amongst the citizens, you know, managing PPE, uh, managing the responses, the resources, people like the NHS, you know, sort of, sort of pseudo governmental bodies that, that was a big piece. Um, the transition to home, you know, uh, work from home, checking in with employees, making sure they're safe, you know, outreach applications, self-report applications, how do you onboard new employees, all those sort of things around the change from the physical to the, to the work from home piece, yeah. very, you know, trying to do it in a very agile way. So that was absolutely um, the piece. I think 
in a very specific contact center piece, those two things, but also uh, changes in volumes, you know, big volumes in some markets, um, you know, travel, transport, um, banking and so on, and coping with those extra volumes and trying to shift stuff to digital channels and self-serve and things like that. So those were the things we saw, I'd say, in the first sort of four to six weeks, I guess. Mm. I think the last week or so, it's absolutely more focused on the, the topic we have today, this back to work, you know, how do I, you know, track my people, um, schedule them and getting them back into the workplace, think about the processes and the, and the um, procedures I need to put in place, you know, in terms of hygiene and, and markings and changing the key button entry to a cordless, you know, to a swipe free so that people aren't touching. It's those sort of yeah. physical things and tracking them. And, and again, making sure we're compliant to enable us to get back to work. That's the sort of change that we're seeing. And I think as well, we hear from a lot of members where their core volumes have halved and yep. have been low for six or eight weeks. And, and they are now, you know, they know those volumes will come back as, as we go back to some sort of normality. And, and, you know, in, in some ways, that's another kind of small crisis for them that all of a sudden, you know, they won't just get back to 100% of core volumes. It will be 130, 150 as they kind of play catch up. Um, so we're seeing that in a lot of sectors that, that you know, half, they've seen um, half the core volume. So, yeah, there's some similar challenges. challenges. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Ian. That was, that was really helpful. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'm now going to introduce you to John. Um, John Sullivan um, was until recently the Chief Innovation Officer and Project Lead at uh, Virgin Trains. He's also worked for some um, great well-known brands such as Laura Ashley, HMV and uh, Disney. Um, at Virgin Trains, he's overall responsibility for change as well as technology and um, is a great believer in if you look after your people, they will look after your customers. So, um, John, can you share with us your thoughts on um, the current situation uh, we find ourselves in and what organisations should be focusing on with, uh, I guess, you know, your, your innovations head and technology head? Yeah, I, I'd love to and, and thanks for ha having me. If you don't mind, Anne-Marie, what, what I'd like to do is start off on a somewhat kind of somber note and then hopefully drive excitement as I go along. And actually, you can score me at the end if you like. Yeah, hit us with it. <laughs> so I think on the somber note, I think there's, you, you know, I think we can absolutely predict that it's going to be a more competitive business environment. I think you, you, you're going to see to a certain extent there's going to be a consolidation of companies out there. I thought it was very interesting, the chance of the exchequer saying, look, he can't save every company. And I think we probably anticipate that. Hopefully it's not to a great extent, but I think not everyone's going to kind of, you know, be there in 12, 24 months. And, you know, I know for sure and talk to my colleagues who work for private equity companies, you know, they would be thinking to a certain extent, what companies are there to be kind of purchased? Can we get a good price from these companies? And, that might mean there's for further consolidation of yeah. organizations. So really my point here, what, what does that mean to kind of change in, in innovation in that more competitive environment that, that, we're, that we're good, I think, believe that we're going to be in. And I think that is going to kind of accelerate that the need for change to do that in a proper way is going to be absolutely critical for companies. I think what we're hearing generally is being proactive is going to be paramount. And that's to ensure that we're all in the best possible place that we can be in six months, 12 months, 24 months. But to drive innovation is going to, for me, is going to be even more critical than, than it has been. I've got a couple of slides now to talk about actually some of the things that I think just need to avoid and then we're getting into how we match customer expectations and some kind of themes just for, for context, contact centers. So I thought it was really interesting. It was last year at some point, I think it was broadly about 12 months ago, PwC in the US and in Europe did a survey on CEO. Now, you know, is list innovation, is that a top priority? Well, actually, almost all of them listed it as, yes, it's absolutely top priority. You can see there it's 97% of kind of actually what, what the other 3% are thinking, but that's not for now. Um, however, there's a, there was a disconnect. So when you're talking to the people who are actually delivering change and it's 
fundamental part of the, the business. You can see more than half the people, you know, and these are people involved in change and innovation, didn't have time to, de you know, develop their ideas. 43% of people didn't know who was responsible for innovation within the business. That wasn't clear. Um, and again, more than half the people didn't think that the business had an innovation um, plan that was effective and, and actually there's a lot of lot of noise around these this survey that I had looked in detail about actually some people knew some people didn't know you know I'm a massive believer and this is getting on to the next point is innovation has changed it's got to be absolutely at the heart of the business and if everyone who's involved in that change and innovation doesn't get that then you know it's going to be really challenging to deliver that aversion trains we did, when I started going back a few years, it was just the technology team that drove innovation. I think why we were so successful is we got the whole business to deliver change. And this is something that we, we're all gonna have to kind of do as businesses to drive change in a kind of single way. And that, you know, we call it digital transformation, but for me, I think it's more than that now. You know, this is, you know, I don't wanna be over dramatic, but this is kind of business survival. I don't know what we should call it. It's is maybe business transformation or business change. But I think everything now, I think we all appreciate is going to be about digital. When I left Virgin Trains, when we lost the rail franchise a few months ago, 95% of our projects were digital, you know, and, and now I'm sure actually 100% of the, them are going to be. There's one thing here that's really important that isn't going to change, and that's leadership. Leadership is going to be critical. Sponsoring is going to be critical. And that view that we're all in this together, we're driving the change, is also going to be critical. I don't think that's ever going to change. John, I think um, yeah. I don't think people will be overly surprised at that, and that, you know, that, it's disappointing, isn't it? But you know, time after time, organisations do surveys, and and the the, the the board go, yeah, everything's great, and we're innovative, and we're going to be digital, and we're our customers love us, and and the guys on on the ground floor are going through these challenges of, well, you know, nobody told me, and why have I got so many blockers, and um, and it, 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 it takes me back again to the, well, you know, maybe politicians versus civil servants and, you know, how, would, how do we join it all up? And, and the digital transformation, you know, this, is a, this has become a disruptor, hasn't it? This situation that we're in has, has really thrown everything up in the air and, and made people, I guess, rethink um, about, you know, don't, don't believe every PowerPoint pres presentation is reality. You know, and I think you're right, it is about... Oh, and I think, you know, and... I think that's a, that's a great point and, and it's something that we found in my early days at Virgin Train. So I think we, we learned how engagement was absolutely critical. There's the disconnect there, but the big thing is in the engagement. And what I really enjoyed is when we were doing presentations within the business, actually, I encouraged dissent because there may be some frustration there when the people that outline their dissent are doing it for the right reason. It's a positive thing, by the way. And they're articulating some challenges and yeah. One of the reasons why leadership is critical, there's many reasons, right? But one of the reasons why it's critical is you've got to listen to that dissent, face into the challenge and, you know, do something about it. But that, that you know, change isn't about technology. Technology is a core, core component. It's all about people. We're all in it together. We've got a single vision of what we're going to achieve and let's drive some excitement. And that's another thing that, that isn't going to change. Agreed. So I feel like the BBC update. Next slide, please. Here's... <laughs> Uh, five o'clock again today um, but here's some reasons that, you know not to do project that, I, that I've seen in my career and I've had you know uh, I've been working for a number of years we won't go into how many years but it's been a number um, I think you know responsibility is is really important so I think in the future we've got to take responsibility I've got a kind of somewhat humorous picture there this is in Hertfordshire the guy who draws the white line along the road there's a tree sticking out he said I'm not a tree cutter I'm, don't do, I'm not moving the tree so what he did he went round the tree but I think when you're driving change it's going to be you know we've got to take on the responsibility you know for the right reasons and again to do that you know I passionately believe this has got to be done as a team but to drive that as a team but to take on that responsibility and the accountability when you're driving change is so important but the next point I've already covered is about you know the team doing it together and I, th I think that the point there is to stay on the current path. It's, it's, it is, this is not business as usual anymore. I didn't think it was before, but again, this COVID situation has accelerated that changes. Don't think the current year, the harvest that was brought from 
the current year's works and efforts and, and, and profitability, I guess, is going to be the same. So I think there is something about thinking holistically about your processes. And just because you did it for the last 10 years doesn't mean that it's right. And that kind of critical look at what, what's happening now, along with delivering great technology, is going to be so important. You know, I'm a great believer in quantum, what, small speedboats and small speedboats is let's do a small change. Let's test and let's learn what's the impact of our colleagues, what's the impact of customers, and then move on to the next small speedboat. So I think business change or digital transformation, as I said, I don't like that name, is going to be about small incremental changes, learning, moving on, improving, but changing rapidly now. You can't, I don't think we can poodle along now with the changes that we've, that we've, that, that we've had previously and if you've done a small speed boat and it hasn't worked well you, you know what that's all right because i'm sure that you'll have lessons from that from doing that and those are just lessons that you can't do again so kind of the mindset here is really important that we get that right it's a positive attitude if failure is okay you just need to learn learn really well about that and i've been in boardrooms you know too long where people have just said you know we can't do this and they've made a career of challenging ideas showing you what what's wrong again mindset wise we've just got to move away from that is actually let's trial this let's test this what do our colleagues think about it get some really really early ideas about the impacts for it has on colleagues and of course on customers but it's not business as usual anymore we, we covered this a little at uh, our annual conference and we talked about how organizations and contact centers um, had got quite risk adverse and and actually maybe over collaborative you know so everybody had to agree with everything and everything kept going kind of up the chain and back down the chain and up the chain and and there, there wasn't space for those as you greatly described in small beat speed speed boats of kind of you know let's get on test learn try some stuff do something different um, so those words uh, those words uh, just reminded me of that uh, that uh, event that we ran well, Anne Marie, absolutely. And, you know, with change, it's got to be at the heart of the business. So if you take example, in my retail days, there used to be a trading meeting and it used to, you know, traditionally you look at how the business is performing and what changes that you need to make in the business. Now, actually reviewing the changes that you're making, reviewing the speedboats has got to be done at that kind of high level, almost board level. And that's got to be kind of weekly because this is paramount for businesses to get right and, and, and therefore succeed. It, it, again, it's all that all in it together kind of type attitude. Absolutely. Uh, so we spoke yeah. a few days ago, and um, and I asked you if you'd come up with some kind of hints and tips for our members, which is the slide that um, that we see in front of us now. So I wonder if you could um, wrap up by talking us through those, John. Yeah. So I, I won't go through all of them. The first one, I think I've covered. Uh, I think the common theme that you can see here is modern technology is absolutely key and, and so therefore be able to, to, to scale. We've talked before, by Adrian has talked earlier about um, cloud first. I think that's, in, that's paramount. But I think modern technology and service now, I think, you know, I'm not just saying this, I'm not being paid by service now, but it's been a brilliant platform, platform for us. It's modern technology. It allows you to be flexible. So when in my previous company were thinking about changing the CR team to be, you know, in the office to working from home, actually that was an, that was an easy change, but allows you to be agile and flexible. And it's not always something that's easy to, when you're justifying a change to kind of list that because there's no necessary financial benefit of that until actually you do what you need to do. We don't always know what's going to happen in the future, but you need the right platform to be able to move quickly. Um, and you know, there's a, be open, you know, again, we talk about encouraging to send that open attitude because we're going to test something and we're going to learn from it. The capture the imagination again is, is really important. So what, what we did at Version Trains is we had a static training crew and we took the board through, here's 14 ideas that we, that we could deliver as part of our digital transformation. And we didn't talk about finances, but we talked about what's the impact these things could have on customers? What could the future of the business be like? not asking you to sign up on the dotted line for these things, but think, I'd ask you everyone, think about when you're considering a change of what that means is how can you capture the imagination? I do think we've got to move away from paper, here's a project justification and send it over to the board and move, move on. But it, so we've got to be creative in how we capture people's imagination 
is you're far more likely to get that delivered. The last point that I'll talk there is about generating excitement. Again, it's all it's all about people. And if you capture people's imagination, you've got some excitement. I know for know from one of the kind of project teams is if people are excited to deliver what what they've got to deliver, oh my God, it makes it so for, so, so much easier. It doesn't feel like work. I'm trying to tell my three daughters, you know, get a job that you love and you never work a day in your life. You know, I have that mindset. Have that mindset that everyone, let's run into work because you're so excited about what you're doing and it won't feel like work if you if you have that mindset and the last point here is just that i think we've got a brilliant opportunity now the technology out there is fantastic there's loads of options there so we've got a great opportunity if we deliver this with people we deliver this in the right manner to really succeed so you know you're thinking about the big bounce companies i think we can have a really big bounce if we get all these things right i've got a final slide how am i doing for time and marie yeah you're okay john Okay, great. So here's just I just wanted to take you through some some themes. I'm sure a lot of you are working on a number of these already. But there's the uh, communication hub. So I think that's you know you're just thinking about a single message to the customer, um, whether that's from the contact centre or, or whether that's from your frontline teams or whether that's from the marketing teams. You've got to think about as much information as you've got from the customer. That consistency of message and sending message at the right time. But that broad one company approach, single look and feel of your messages. I'm, I'm sure a number of you are working on what I call communication hub. I know for sure that a lot of you are working on AI, a lot of great technology out there. Again, ServiceNow is great. Customers, I think, believe will want to do more self-serve. So what portals have you got? How can you drive that, you know, that change? And how can you do that even faster? How can you automate that? Because let's face it, I don't think people want to do manual work be in a company that a lot of the manual work is automated and that's connected to the third point and, and I love this subject about technology for humanity at a certain point you've got a complicated issue so you need to hand that over to to a human in the contact center but generally I think those people are the people who need that just extra little bit of care for whatever reason so now if you've got more automation you can give those customers that extra little bit of care who need it. a few more minutes, a bit more understanding and understanding why their issue is so complicated. Point four, um, I, and I love this point, is about if you get to a point, and I think you've got to be relatively confident in, in what you can deliver to do this. We have certainly did this over the last few years is ask the business, what's the biggest business challenge? Or think yourself, what's your business, big, biggest business challenges that you have? And if you've got the right platform, the right mindset to deliver change, so take that on board. Let, let's go away. How can you deliver against that and resolve that challenge? Point five is a common thing. This is my last point about what well, that's a lovely picture, isn't it? I can just on the beach, getting some sun, seeing sand, you, you, your laptop. I guess you'd have to have Wi Fi on your beach. That may be a challenge. Um, but I think if you've got more data on what the call center teams are doing and you've got your key KPIs to, to judge people, does it matter about where they are in, in the office? There's going to be less of that, let's face it, or on the beach or in a coffee shop. It doesn't matter. But in a turbulent environment that we're in at the moment, you can thrive by, by doing some of these things that I've got. So it, that was just a high level kind of, my, I think that's my final slide, Anne-Marie. Fantastic. John, thank you so much. We, we covered a lot there. So thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Um, some, um, some real good tips there. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to um, bring the seminar to a close now because we, um, we've, we've reached um, one o'clock. Um, I just want to share with you some events that we've got coming up for members. So you can find all these on the website. Our special interest group roundtables that are taking place every fortnight. Um, they are for quality management, complaints management, retail leadership, general insurance and social housing. And then we on Thursday are doing a virtual best practice practice visit to BT in Newcastle. Um, they won Contact Centre of the Year at the European Contact Centre Awards last year. So we're doing um, a one and a half hour virtual visit to them. And then on the 9th of June, we have um, a seminar with Peninsula, who are HR legal experts, and they're going to talk us through furlough and, and all those other great things that are linked to COVID and bringing people back to work. And then on the 17th of June, um, we're going to focus on retail contact centres and um, that, again, will be an online seminar. 
And then just before I wrap up, just want to remind you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the European Awards um, are now open for nominations. Um, and the deadline for those is the 28th of August. And if you take a look at the categories, we have introduced five new categories this year that are specifically focused on the situation that we've gone through in the last couple of months and still go through around COVID. So responding in a crisis, the best partner solution, the best um, leadership provided, supporting colleagues, supporting customers, and responding in a crisis, supporting the community. So if you've not uh, been online yet, uh, please do and have a look at those. You've got um, a few months yet to put your nominations together, but it is definitely a time when we want to kind of acknowledge all the amazing work that our industry and our, our contact centre colleagues have done. Um, so it just remains me they'd say um, a big thank you to all of our speakers today. So Ian, Adrian and John. And um, thank you to ServiceNow for um, supporting this event. And thank you um, to the hundreds of people that have taken time out today to join us. A reminder that we're recording this seminar, it'll be on the CCMA website tomorrow, um, along with the answers to the Q, few Q&As that you've, you've um, raised, we've I think dealt with most of them as we've gone on. And um, have a great afternoon and look forward to seeing you at an event again soon. Thanks very much, bye.